but I want you to open your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6, Ephesians chapter 6, and as you turn there, I'm going to tell you about two of my books. One of them, some of you may have, it's a well-known book. Brother Hagin said it was a classic on spiritual warfare. In fact, he used this book taught from the pulpit back when he was living. It's a book called Dress to Kill. How many of you have Dress to Kill? This really is an outstanding book. And it's based on what I'm going to be speaking to you about today. And for people who are not ready to go into something that big, we've recently made a smaller version which will help you get just to the very meat of the message about spiritual warfare and what kind of weapons God has given to us. And these would be a blessing to you. And so today we're going to begin in Ephesians chapter 6. And we're going to read verse 10, verse 11, and begin teaching in verse 12. Now, I hope you have a pencil and a pen or a piece of paper because today I believe you're going to want to take notes. And in fact, let me see your Bibles. Any kind of Bible, telephone, iPad, real Bible, anybody? Wonderful. Good to see your Bibles. So let's all open together to Ephesians chapter 6. And Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for this time in the Word of God. And Holy Spirit, today we ask you to open the Scripture to us and to help us see what we could never naturally see with our eyes. You authored this book. You're the only one who really has the authority to teach it. And Holy Spirit, as the great teacher, we ask that today you would speak to us and give us ears to hear. In Jesus' name, amen. Ephesians chapter 6, we're going to begin in verse 10. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Verse 11. Put on the whole armor of God that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Verse 12. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness, in high places. In verse 12, Paul, by divine revelation, begins to describe for us how Satan's kingdom is aligned militarily. And you'll find at the very top of Satan's kingdom, there is a ruling group of demon spirits, which are called principalities. I'll come back to this in just a moment. Directly under them is a second category, which is called powers. Nextly, he mentions a third category called rulers of the darkness of this world. And finally, spiritual wickedness in high places. And we find as we look at these words that Satan's kingdom is highly, highly organized. Now, where did he learn this order? Did Satan just create this order by himself? And the answer is no. Satan had been an archangel before he was cast from the presence of God. And in heaven, there are cherubim, there are seraphim, there are all kinds of levels of angels, and there is great order in heaven. And so when Satan began to set up his kingdom, he simply replicated the order which he had already known in heaven. But he replicated it on an evil level. And the Bible tells us at the very top of Satan's kingdom, there is a group of spirits which Paul calls principalities. This word principalities is taken from the Greek word arkos. The word arkos describes something from the very beginning or something very ancient, and it describes the highest, most exalted positions of power. For instance, in the Old Testament Septuagint, if it talks about the highest rulers, it would always use this same word arkos. This is the highest level of power. And we know by reading the Old Testament that the Bible tells us there are principalities or ruling spirits. You can see this in the book of Daniel. In the book of Daniel, the Bible tells us that Daniel began to pray. And we all know that Daniel fasted. Most churches today do a Daniel fast once a year. And finally, after 21 days of praying, an angel appears. And the angel says, Daniel, I'm become I've come because of your prayers. Your prayers were heard 21 days ago when you began praying. And I've come because of your words. Well, now, wait a minute. 
The Bible also tells us that angels are spirits. Angels don't know anything in terms of distance like we would know distance. Their ability to move back and forth almost at a flash, it's just instantaneous. So for an angel to make a journey for 21 human days, that is a very long journey for an angel. Why did it take the angel so long? And the angel said to Daniel, as I was en route to answer your prayer, I was confronted by the prince of Persia. The prince of Persia, Arcos, the same word which we're looking at here, the Greek word for a principality, was a ruling spirit which ruled over the region of ancient Persia. And the prince of Persia, this ruling demonic spirit, was so resistant to the angel who is en route to Daniel, that a great war took place in the heavens. And the Bible says that Michael the archangel came to assist him. And because of Michael's assistance, the angel was able to break through and finally come to Daniel. We're talking about very high level spiritual warfare on an angelic realm. And not only that, but once the angel had delivered the answer, the answer to Daniel, he then said to Daniel, now I'm going to return, and when I return, I will again have to deal with the prince of Persia, and not just with the prince of Persia, but I will have to fight with the prince of Greece. All of this is in Daniel chapter 10, these ruling, dominating spirits. And you can see their effect in different parts of the world even until this hour. These are not flesh and blood, and you cannot defeat them with flesh and blood. For example, all the wars and the conflicts which we have had in the Middle East. I understand the position of the United States, but bullets do not affect ruling principalities. Bullets affect what is on the ground. And those things keep reappearing and reappearing over a period of time because it's something in the heavenly realm. If you don't deal with that realm, eventually it will just keep resurfacing over and over and over. I live in Moscow, Russia, where the same spirit has dominated from the days of Ivan the Terrible. It is exactly the same spirit. It just keeps reappearing with a different face over and over and over because there is a principality which rules over Russia. There's a principality which rules over the Middle East. These are ruling spirits, the very highest ranking spirits, according to the Apostle Paul. Directly under them is a second category. It says, for we wrestle not against principalities, but against powers. This word powers the Greek word exousias describes those that have received license or delegated authority to operate on a local region. So now we find that just like there are ruling principalities, that's where we get the word for a prince, a spiritual principality which can lord itself over an entire region of the world, there are also lower level spirits which congregate locally in smaller regions. And Paul says, we struggle with these. Then he says, directly unto them are the rulers of the darkness of this world. Well, principalities, I understood. The Greek word archos, it could also be used to describe the generals of an army. Interesting, isn't it? The word powers, exousias, those that have received license to operate on a local region. And in fact, it was the word which was used by the ancient Greeks to describe individuals on the level of like a colonel in an army. Then you come to the third word. The third word, rulers of the darkness of this world, is the Greek word cosmo kraterus, cosmos, describes something that is ordered or something that is arranged. The word kratos describes power. When you compound the two words together, cosmocrateros, it describes power that has been ordered, power that has been arranged, power that has been harnessed and focused. And in fact, it is the same word which was used by classical writers to describe what we would call a boot camp or a military training center for young soldiers. Well, think about it. What, what is a training, military training center? 
It's power, raw power. All these young men brought into one place where cosmos, they are harnessed, they are organized, they are focused, and they become a force. A place where soldiers are taught how to use their instruments and taught how to use their weapons. And often they become very specified in what they do. Well, when I first studied this text, it was the year 1976. And back in the year 1976, there were not a lot of exegetical teachers, and I began to search for someone who could help me with this word because I knew just by the usage, the linguistic usage of this word, rulers of the darkness of this world, the Greek word cosmokrateros, it meant a military boot camp or a training center. And I began to ask people who taught the Bible but who didn't know Greek because back in those days there were not a lot who exegeted. Does anybody know what this means? Does anybody know what this means, that the, the devil has a training center or there's the training of spirits? And no one understood that. So I decided just to put it in the back of my mind and wait till some later time. So in 1986, Denise and I had begun our teaching traveling ministry. And we were ministering in western Oklahoma in a church. Many years had passed, 10 years since I had first studied this text. And at the end of the service, I gave an invitation for people to be prayed for who had some kind of physical sickness. And a man and woman came forward. They were, no, they were unsaved. They were not churched at all. They didn't know any Christian vocabulary. In fact, they kind of looked at us like we were all nutty, but they ended up at the front for prayer because they had something physically wrong with them. So what they said to me was not based on what they heard somewhere else. This was just someone naive about spiritual things describing something they had experienced. And the man was standing there with his hands behind his pocket. And I said, why are you here? He said, I need prayer for my hands. And he pulled his hands out from behind his back and it looked like someone had deformed his hands. It was like lumps of flesh stuck to the end of his arms. I said, sir, what happened to you? He said, I'm gonna tell you what I told the doctor. I know it sounds crazy, but this is the truth. Denise was standing at my side. He said, I felt something come on my hands. He said, that's the only way I know how to explain it. My hands begin to hurt. And over a number of years, he said, you can see where they've performed surgery to try to help me. Nothing could stop this. He said, and finally, when my hands were like this, I felt that thing lift off of me. And when it left me, it left me like this. Standing next to him was his wife. She had her hands in her pockets. I said, are you here for prayer? She said, yes. There's a part of the story my husband didn't tell you. She said, the very same day he felt that thing lift off of him, I felt it come on me. She took her hands out of her pockets and they were like replications of her husband's hands, gnarled like masses of flesh stuck on the end of her limbs. And she said, when my hands were ruined, I felt that thing leave me. And I don't know where it went, but I'm sorry for the person wherever it went. And when I saw this, standing right in the prayer line, it was like the Holy Spirit reached back into my mind to grab this word, rulers of the darknesses of this world, the Greek word cosmokrateros, a place where soldiers are taught how to use their weapons to be very specific in what they do. And I saw in front of me and I understood this was a spirit of infirmity trained to do one specific thing. And when it was finished with one, it dislodged and moved to the next available candidate. And when it was finished with this one, it dislodged and then it began to move to another person. 
And I begin to make observations about how sicknesses could be passed from generation to generation. It's like something attaches itself to a family or even attaches itself to a group of people, and it's just passed between those people. And I begin to understand these are spirits that are trained to do specific things. For instance, there are spirits of divorce. That's all they do. And they are trained to come into a happy home and destroy it. There are spirits that cause people to be confused about their identity. And that's what they do. And when they're finished, they dislodge and they move on to do it somewhere else. Everything is not spiritual. I'm not saying that. But we're foolish if we don't acknowledge that a lot of it is. But the good news is, in Christ, through the Word of God, through the blood of God, the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the authority and we have the right to break those things so they are not transmitted. We can stop them from being transmitted. But the point is, Satan is so serious about what he does. The demons are not just sent forth randomly to do what they do. They are sent forth with great instruction. And based on John 10.10, 10, I say their motto is kill, steal, and destroy. Wish I had time to teach on those three words. It's much broader than you ever imagine. For instance, the word steal is the same word for a pickpocket. The devil won't be happy till he has his hands in your pocket and he takes everything that he can get out of it. Oh, how I wish I had time to expand on those words. These spirits are dispatched. And the fourth part of the verse describes their dispatchment, spiritual wickedness in high places. The word wickedness is the Greek word poneros. The word poneros describes something that is malevolent, something absolutely wicked that has the intention to destroy. So when these spirits were trained, I don't know when, I don't know how, but when these spirit of infirmities received their training, then they were dispatched and when they were dispatched, they were malevolent. They were wicked. Now, Paul says they were dispatched into the high places. Spiritual wickedness in, what does it say? High places. Well, that's a very unfortunate translation. It's not high places like the moon. Why would the devil care? There's no one out there. High places is the Greek word eros. It describes the air we breathe or the environment where we live. And if you want to use it technically correct, it describes the air below the mountaintops. So we find that these spirits have been dispatched into the lower, denser regions of the air. Yes, it is the air. But into the environment where we live, where they can touch people, where they can afflict people. So now when you look at this entire text, you find a great commitment and a great organization which the devil has had in his victimization of the human race. It's not accidental. In fact, even Pastor Duane and I were talking before we came into church today about the end times and about the Antichrist. Think how long the devil has been working a plan to produce a society which would receive what the Bible calls a man of lawlessness. Even 50 years ago, a man of lawlessness could have never taken a leading position in the world because the role of Christianity was too strong. But today the world is becoming a lawless place where people don't even know doctrine and the next generation, the younger generation, doesn't even believe that it's important what you believe as long as you do believe because ultimately all roads lead to one place and they're trying to even eliminate the concept of sin. As we know, sin is becoming very unfashionable and and the world is becoming a place where it is lawless, everything is fine, and a society is being created which will embrace one of their own, a man of lawlessness. That kind of thing doesn't happen overnight. There's got to be a strategy. There has got to be a plan to develop that kind of thing. Now, the good news is, the end of the book belongs to us. The point is, even if we have the victory, there is an enemy.
And Paul did not give us these verses to scare us. He gave us these verses to prepare us. Everybody say prepare us. He gave us these verses to prepare us. Paul said our battle is not with flesh and blood. That's why bullets alone will never solve the problem. There are spiritual realities. If they are not changed, it will keep reemerging over and over and over. That's why the signing of documents alone will not really change the attitude of a nation. Something has got to be done in the spirit because there are invisible forces that are at work. And the word wrestle, which is used in verse 12, because of the day in which we live, we think of two men that are wrestling. That is not what this means. It is the Greek word poly, which is taken from the word palestra. The palestra was a big athletic complex which existed in every major Greek and Roman city. Every New Testament believer who read this verse understood what I'm going to explain to you. Now, if I said to you the word football, I wouldn't have to stop and explain it to you because you've grown up in a world of football. We did not grow up in the world of poly, the world that is used, the word that is used here. But the Greeks, the New Testament believers, the Roman Empire, they knew this word, poly, from the word palestra. The word palestra was an athletic facility, which literally meant the house of combat sports or the house of struggle. And in that facility, there were primarily three sports. One was boxing. Usually, you boxed until the opponent was dead or at least maimed. Their gloves had hobnails which were attached to the end of their wrists, and that's why when you look at the vases of the Romans and the Greeks and you look at their boxers, their noses are missing, their ears are missing. It's because it was like boxing Freddy Krueger, if you remember that old movie. These men had knives on the ends of their wrists. That was one of the sports. The second sport was wrestling. In wrestling, there were basically no rules to the game. You could gouge out eyes, you could break backs, you could break fingers, anything was fair as long as when the fight concluded, you were standing, the other was fallen. And then there was the third sport called pancration. And I find it fascinating that Pancration is being reinvented today. You can watch it on television. It is awful. It's absolutely awful. You're fighting with weapons that have spikes, clubs that have spikes, doing anything you can do. There's no rules. It's like a mixture of kung fu, wrestling, boxing, all of it put together. These were the three type of sports which were carried out in the palestra, which is where we get the word pale, used at the very first of verse 12, which in the English translation is translated wrestle. Well, everyone who saw that word, because they were from that world, they didn't need the explanation that I just gave you. Just seeing that word would have caused them to set up straight in their seats because they knew this. Everyone was familiar with what took place in a palestra. No one would enter into a competition in the palestra without training, without exercise, without being fit. No one would dare even attempt it because the fight is so intense. And that is the word which Paul uses here to tell us the intensity that spiritual warfare can involve. Then on top of that, he says our fight is not against what? Flesh and blood, but what? Against, everybody say against. Against principalities. What's the next word? Against, everybody say against. Powers. What's the next word? Against rulers of the darkness of this world. And what's the next word? Against spiritual wickedness in high places. Linguistically, he did not have to repeat that word against all those times. He could have said it once for all of them. The only reason you would repeat a word that fast over and over and over in a Greek sentence is if you're trying to drive a point home. He did not have to do that. It's not linguistically required. But he says four times 
in reference to these powers, against, 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 against. Well, the word against would normally be the word anti, like antichrist or to be anti-societal. But in this case, it's not the word anti. It's the word pros, P-R-O-S. Oh, 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 oh. The word pros, the word pros means face to face. It is the same identical word used in the Gospel of John, chapter 1, verse 1, the same word, which says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was, what does it say? With God. The Greek says, pros tantheon. In the beginning was the word, that's Jesus, and the word was pros God. It is a picture of such intimacy in the Trinity that the Father and the Son are prostantheon. They are face to face. They are so close. They are so intimate. They can nearly feel each other's breath breathing upon the other's face. Intimacy in the Godhead. And now this same word the Holy Spirit uses in this verse to describe what kind of conflict spiritual warfare believes involves it's not something that happens to someone on the other side of the world but it's something that you may come face to face with one expositor in order to add a little interest to the verse but still captures the idea says face to face with principalities rib cage to rib cage with power shoulder to shoulder against the rulers of the darkness of this world but it right up next to it. This would have been a very easy thing for believers in the first century to understand because they were living in a world of darkness. As they walked through the streets of Ephesus, they could see the temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the world. 7,000 full-time priests and priestess who did demonic things. Or they could walk up the street and see the temple of Asclepius or the temple of Domitian. There was darkness all around them. Or back behind the market, something they won't even let you see if you go to Ephesus today, was the temple of Serapis, a temple so monumental that when you see the columns of this temple, my friend, these, these were not just ritual fantasies. There were spiritual powers at work in this place. Now, we may not have pagan temples around us today. No, today the devil has kind of skipped that phase. We are en route to a reemergence of paganism. Where the devil is trying to level the playing field and Christianity just becomes one religion among others. It's okay for you to believe what you believe as long as you don't say your faith is an exclusionary faith, that your way is the only way. That's when you get in trouble. As long as you respect everyone else's religion, you're going to be all right. But the day that you say, this is the way, that is the day that you have crossed a line in our present culture. Young people don't even understand that kind of exclusionary view. The devil has just skipped right over the pagan temples and he is striking what is basically pagan tenets into the heart of a generation. A lawless generation who will receive a man of lawlessness. It's really where we're headed. Now, what does this have to do with us? Well, we're living here. Even if we're not a part of that, we're living here. Jesus prayed that though we were in the world, we would not be of the world. There should be a separation in our thinking. There should be a separation in our believing. We do not have to be like them. We don't have to sound like them. And guess what? Church was not created for them. Church is created for the family of God. That's what it's made for. It's made for the family of God. And we don't have to apologize for being the church or acting like the church. When we are in church, that's what we are. But Paul says to the Ephesians, 
And he says to us, you need to know this. You need to understand why God wants to give you power. Power is what he talks about in verse 10. Verse 11, put on the whole armor of God. Now we understand why we need the whole armor of God. And when you get to verse 13, he says, wherefore? The word wherefore, or the Greek word is diatalto, which literally translated, in light of what I have just said to you. You see, he doesn't leave them in fear. He's drawing them to a conclusion. In light of what I have just said to you, take unto you the whole armor of God that you might be able to withstand, everybody say withstand, in the evil day. That word withstand means to repel. A better translation would be that you may be able to with repel in the evil day. This armor and the power of God puts us in a position where we're not just little victims, but we can stand upright and repel these attacks. I said to my congregation, the devil can do whatever he wants in the world. Jesus even acknowledged he was the prince of darkness. The apostle Paul called him the God of this world. The word world is the word cosmos. It describes the ordered system of society. The devil may have authority there, but where Jesus is Lord is not his territory. He has no right to operate inside the church. He has no right to operate in my life. I am a walking island everywhere I go. And wherever I go, Jesus is Lord. And if the devil tries to cross that line, the armor of God gives me the ability to withstand or to repel him because he does not have the authorization to operate on this territory. And that leads us to the next part of the verse, and I'm about to close. That you may withstand or repel in what kind of a day? What does it say in verse 13? In the evil day. What is the evil day? Wow. Is that something on the prophetic time chart? No. The evil day? Is any time evil tries to get in your day? It's that simple. Evil does not belong in my life. And if evil tries to penetrate that border, I have the ability to withstand it in the evil day. Any evil day, when I wake up and there's been a bad doctor's report, I have the right to repel that. If you wake up and hear something about your children that is disturbing, you have the right to repel that. You can repel and push that evil back across the line. Now, it's going to require you to be fit why we had to understand the word palestra. It's going to require an attitude of resistance. It's going to require determination. And if you're just having to take an easy Christian life, probably you're not going to be too good at this. This takes commitment. And then at the end of the verse, Paul wraps it up by saying, and having done all, stand. You know, that bothered me for so many years. Because to my mind, it sounds like, and having done all, if nothing works, if the Word of God doesn't work, if the armor of God doesn't work, if the power of God doesn't work, if nothing works, having done all, having tried everything you know to do, if nothing is working, then just stand right. As if standing is going to give us a victory, the devil will just beat the pulp out of us. If the Word doesn't work, if the power doesn't work, if the armor doesn't work, then just standing and looking at him is not going to be effective. So what does he mean when he says, having done all, stand? I call this a snapshot. The Greek tense describes something that is finished and complete. It really means having brought all of your battles to an ultimate conclusion. In other words, now you're looking backwards. You're not fighting battles anymore. You fought all of your battles. You've been through every struggle. You've been through every conflict and having done all. You now it's all done. It's all behind you. Paul says, now if you'll do what you're required to do, here is a snapshot of your future. 
When it's all said, it's all done, it's all behind you, having done all, you are not the one laying on the ground, smashed, bleeding and bruised. But God says, I see you and I declare to you, when it's all done, you'll be standing. You'll be standing. Now, if you're in the middle of a fight, that's really good news. If you've struggled with something for a long time and you feel like you're never going to get out of that struggle, this is really good news. God says, hey, let me pull a snapshot out of my pocket, but this one's of your future. He pulls it out, and there you are, battles behind you, you standing upright, shoulders thrown back like Goliath under David's feet. You are standing when this thing is wrapped up. Now, that's what the power of God and the armor of God is supplied for. So when this deal's done, we can finish with a smile on our face because we're standing. Did you get something out of this today? 